Hello everyone! Today we are continuing the lecture series. After the introductory lecture on the conception, today is our first topic. It is the most important topic which everything is based upon. It is the foundation of the conception. The name of the topic is Trinity – matter, information and measure. Man perceives the surrounding world with his senses. The picture shows us the way man perceives the surrounding world. In the universe all the processes are oscillatory. Sound is oscillatory, light is oscillatory, the electron is oscillatory and moves around the atom, the nucleus is in the molecule, the earth spins around the sun, the moon spins around the earth, the sun somehow moves in the galaxy. All processes are oscillatory. Radio waves are oscillations, and electromagnetic waves are oscillations too. Man perceives all oscillations with his senses. As textbooks say, eyesight is a visible spectrum of frequencies, hearing is a sound spectrum, smell is a perception at the molecular level, there are also touch and taste. All these senses are recognized by mainstream science. Biofields still remain unrecognized by it, although nowadays scientists begin to recognize the sense of the biofield. Man also emits and perceives oscillations. This is what we are going to discuss. Here is an example of such a perception. There is a flash on the sun. As a result, someone's cardiovascular system crumples up. You know these horoscopes – favorable and unfavorable days. What is this? In other words, solar oscillatory processes influence man, so to say he perceives these oscillatory processes. Man also has a biofield. The conception of social safety gives a lot of attention to biofield structures. Oscillations are emitted and perceived by man through biofields. What conclusion can we make? Man perceives everything around him as oscillatory processes by means of his senses as well as his biofield. This picture represents worldview systems. Whatever happens in the universe, man can perceive right or wrong. Depending on his perceptions, there can be certain consequences. Life and death of civilizations depend on these consequences. The source of these consequences can be the right or wrong understanding of the surrounding world. In other words, as we have said it in the introductory lecture, if man perceives the surrounding world correctly, if he estimates situations and events, occurrences around him, as well as events of social life correctly, then he will make the right decisions. If he perceives the surrounding world incorrectly, then he makes erroneous decisions. Here is the most impressive example. A drinker, who can see double. He therefore sees the world distorted. He can see two people, but in fact there is only one. I know a case where a drinker had a car accident. How did it happen? He was riding a bike. There was a car coming towards him with one headlight on. He thought there were two bikers, so he decided to go through between them. As a result, he found himself under a car. What is a strike? How do we look at it? Is it a struggle of people for their rights? Or is it actually someone using people to achieve their goals? Actually, there are a lot of paradoxical phenomena like these, when we find things obvious at first glance. But if we look deeper, things look different. As we see, people can live in harmony with the surrounding world and other people, or they can use others as talking tools to exploit them as cattle. In fact, we live in THE civilization, where some take others as subhumans come. The worldview systems define what kind of society people live in – monarchy, democracy and so on. The worldview systems are the main platforms for other things like history, ideology, finance, law and so on. All these things depend on the worldview systems. What is a worldview? 
It is a set of principles, views and convictions which define man's attitude to the surrounding world and himself. Imagine the following picture of a chemical plant. A plane bombing, demonstrators with banners walking on one side and the sun shining, birds singing on the other. Man looks at this side of life and the other one. On the basis of his understanding, he creates his attitude to nature, life, social processes, economy, and so on. The worldview principles, a set of these principles, views and convictions, are formed on the basis of philosophical, nervous, aesthetic, and political principles. But only philosophy, generalizing all these elements of the worldview system, makes the worldview complete. What types of worldviews are there? Speaking of the well-known worldview classifications, there is a wide variety of worldview types. In fact, you can group them into two major types. The first dominant one in the world now is of a materialistic worldview. The second one is of an idealistic worldview. In other words, the materialistic worldview is a scientific one, and the idealistic worldview is a religious one, which are religious beliefs, cults, and so on. Additionally, there is a wide variety of other names. All these names can be reduced to two models. The first model is a kaleidoscope. The second one is a mosaic. What is a mosaic? At exhibitions you have probably come across mosaic paintings made of small pieces of stones and glass in different colors. A person looking at this picture, even if some pieces of this old mosaic painting have already come off, can complete this painting in their mind. Speaking of a kaleidoscope, there is such a toy that you rotate and you can see changing patterns. When people have a kaleidoscopic view, they think everything that happens is accidental. There is chaos everywhere. There are no cause-effect relationships. But if they have a mosaic perception of the world, the world is one and holistic. Everything in the world is unordered. Everything in the world is interdependent and interconditioned. All the processes are interrelated one way or another by means of the determined measure of development. It looks obvious, however, it can cause profound consequences. Official sciences are based on the kaleidoscopic perception of the world. Everything that happens is accidental and so there is chaos. In particular, many economic theories are based on the so-called theory of Ilya Prigozhin. Another name of this theory is synergetics. There are some other names. What's the essence of it? Ilya Prigozhin was of Russian descent. He lived in Belgium. He died in 2003. He wrote famous books such as Order Out of Chaos, The Era of Time, and many others. What is this book, Synergetics, about? In his book, he does a simple thing. He shifts processes from the physics and chemistry worlds onto social processes. He says that there are processes when something diffuses, molecules collide with each other, in other words, there is chaos. Under a certain course of circumstances, a bifurcation point turns up and the system enters a new state. In fact, in the physics and chemistry worlds, there are such phenomena, but you cannot shift them onto the social environment. Why? Because this does not take man's consciousness into account, as if we were void of reason. It's like, you people diffuse and a revolution happens. Then a bifurcation point turns up and we enter a new state. In other words, what he means to say is, social environment processes are out of control. Once I was at a Kondratiev Waves conference, which took place in St. Petersburg in 1995. I was surprised. All the economists making speeches spoke from the standpoint of Ilya Prigozhin, which is based on synergetics, chaos, 
and a bifurcation point. That's to say, economics is based on this theory. The world is not holistic for them. That's why these two models are very important. How can you make a choice? The right decision lies in your hands. Either you understand the deal or you don't. If you do not understand it, then this or that model gets imposed onto you. How is this achieved? The mosaic and the kaleidoscope consist of the same glass. Let's look at this slide. What do we see here? If you look at all this knowledge as tiles, for example, physics is the green one, chemistry is the blue one, and so on. Here you can see blank squares. Man looks at this picture and that one. You can give this knowledge to man as a mosaic or kaleidoscopic picture. If man has a mosaic worldview, even if a piece of the picture is gone, the person can understand the picture as one piece. But if he has a kaleidoscopic perception of the world, changing the tiles is enough so that the picture could look completely different. All education builds people's kaleidoscopic idiocy. When a person gains a lot of knowledge, but he cannot piece it all together. One day, when I was in a public library in St. Petersburg, I came across a book called The Primary School Reader, written by Vodovozov. This book is for ordinary people. It looks like this. You turn over a page, you see a poem. God's bird knows no mass, no fuss. Then you turn over a page to see a text about animal's life. You turn over this page, there is a fable there. You turn over the page again, you see some information on geography. Then another page contains information on history. In other words, this book built children's holistic perception of the world. But what do we have now? We have separate lessons for different subjects. Here is an example. Politicians do not understand that religion itself is a means of governance of millions of people. As they do not understand it, they state that religion is separate from state. How come? Surely, on the basis of influential religious information, people make decisions, which also impacts their everyday behavior in a certain way. However, politicians state that religion and state remain separate. Different religions have different ideologies. The ideology of Christians is different from the ideology of Muslims in terms of usury. However, our government does not understand it either. Why? Because they suffer from kaleidoscopic idiocy. They cannot understand such a simple thing which we discussed in the introductory lecture. They say, I'm not involved in politics. Politics is a means of governance of millions of people. However, some of them think they should address economic matters. But political views define the world of economic relations. So, you see, they speak nonsense. I attended a forum recently. If I recall correctly, it was a forum of Russian manufacturers led by Rishkov, ex-Prime Minister under Gorbachev. Dilagin made a speech there. By the way, they are now bringing him into the limelight. He stated at the forum, I have come to a conclusion that I need to initiate into politics, because you cannot solve any issues of the country only with the help of economic measures. He therefore joined that party, Rodina. If we recall the time of perestroika, the so-called reforms, what do we see? What did our outstanding reformers, Berezovsky and Gusinsky, do at the very beginning of perestroika? They addressed economic matters. Afterwards, they realized that economy is subordinated to politics. They therefore rushed to get into the Duma. But the Duma does not carry out an independent policy, because the Duma is subordinated to global politics. So you see the way it gets revealed and becomes obvious. School education forms the basis of this understanding. Therefore, economy itself cannot be effective. Governance of national economic processes can be effective. For this reason, one should know how economy is governed, methods and ways of its governance. 
do you remember what our general secretary stated? He said, economy should be economical. It is such nonsense. Now, you see, everything is based on governance. That's why philosophy also performs a methodological function. Methodology is a system of principles, ways of building and organizing theoretical and practical life. That's to say, everything is determined by methodology. Methodology itself is a teaching about the whole system. Therefore, methodology is a basis on which you yourself can cognate the world. If you don't know it, you become a hostage to the person who knows it. Let's recall those pyramids from the introductory lectures. A pyramid of the society structure and a pyramid of knowledge. On top of that pyramid there is methodology. Therefore, if you don't know methodology, you become a hostage to the one who knows and understands it. As Kozma Prutkov said, behold the root. Therefore, methodology is the root of any power. So, if you don't know methodology, you can be fooled. The conception of social safety states, everyone should master their methodology. In other words, you have to distinguish what is right or wrong, what is true or false, what is previous and what is not, and so on. They are simple things. The importance of methodology resides in that. To confirm what I have already said, let's look at this picture. What do we see here? What methodology prevailed in Russia till 1917? It was the church quotation dogmatic methodology. In other words, it was theology, the Bible. What was the statehood built on? It was built on orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality. All the doctrines were biblical. Therefore, a new methodology of dialectical materialism turned up. The other name is Diamat. Diamat handled the previous methodology easily. Why did Bolsheviks win? Because they put workers at school desks for studying. They gave workers a new methodology which had a lot of mistakes. However, it was more powerful than the quotation dogmatic theology. That's why dialectical materialism handled it easily. If we watch newsreel footage, we can see that it was people who destroyed churches. However, nowadays those who are interested make contrary claims. It happened because people saw that what popes did was different from what they said at the pulpit. The same thing happened in 1991. People saw that what general secretaries did was different from what they said. Many wonder why people didn't come out to protect the authorities. There were 20 million ideological fighters in 1991. However, none of them lifted a finger. Why? It was the same thing. Ordinary people saw what was going on with the Central Committee of the Communist Party, where there were too many essays but no results. People saw what was going on. Therefore, when it happened, they didn't support the authorities. That was how people reacted to such a thing. Three generations of Soviet people mastered the ideology of Diamat, which is more advanced than the ecclesiastical one. Therefore, they cannot be dragged back into the ideology of quotation dogmatic theology, which has a lot of mistakes. Such attempts are bound to fail. Actually, our country is far ahead of other countries. In terms of what? In 1917, we abandoned idealistic atheism. In 1991, we abandoned materialistic atheism. There is no God in church anyway. Instead of God, there is some idea of it. Therefore, our country, like no other country in the world, is ready to perceive the holistic worldview based on another methodology. What conclusion can we make from what I have already said? In order to conceal the possibility of cognition of the world, the methodology had to be removed and hidden. This was done by the ancient Egyptian Jratsis. This is what we talked about at the very beginning, and now we will touch upon it again. 
I'd like to remind something because different people watch these lectures. What is idealism? Idealism derives from French, idealism, and Greek idea. It's an ancient philosophical teaching about the ideal and spiritual foundation of the world. The teaching doesn't reject nature and matter, but regards them as inferior and thus not genuine. The opposite teaching is materialism. The Bible is a document which expresses ideals of idealism. Let's look what the books Pentateuch written by Moses tell us about Genesis. Let's think about it. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What is the creation process like? The first day is the creation of the light and the division of the light from the darkness day, night. The second day is the creation of the firmament of the heaven. The third day is the creation of the land and the plants. The fourth day is the creation of two great lights. Take note, two great lights. One of them is the sun and the other one is the moon. The fifth day is the creation of great whales, every living creature and every wind fowl. The sixth day is the creation of cattle, creeping thing and beast, and the creation of man. On the seventh day God rested. Why did I say all that? Everyone being present today or watching this video, do you believe it or not? It's up to you. If you want to believe that God rests, you can believe it. I want to quote another document, the Quran. It refers to almost the same episode. It reads, God, there is no God except He, the living, the everlasting. Neither slumber overtakes Him, nor sleep. In other words, He doesn't rest. To Him belongs everything in the heavens and on earth. Who is He that can intercede with Him except with His permission? He knows what is before them and what is behind them, and they cannot grasp any of His knowledge except as He wills. His throne extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation does not burden him. He is the Most High, the Great. What does this definition of God tell us? The universe is eternal. The universe has always been there. God never rests. Everything in the universe belongs to Him. However, the Bible says that there was nothing in the universe. So to say, there are two beginnings. Either the universe is eternal, lasts forever, and all the processes in the universe are governed, or there was nothing and the universe was created from nothing. In other words, it boils down to the Big Bang theory as a version of the appearance of the universe. Bear in mind, all scientists consider this based on their knowledge on the fragment of the universe, but they don't know all about it. Speaking of the Big Bang, it might have happened in our fragment of the universe, then the process opposed to it should have happened in a fragment that we are not aware of. That's to say, all the processes in the universe are oscillatory. Oscillations can last, and the way we can measure them is by means of hertz per second. But they may last millions, billions and even trillions of years. These oscillatory processes in the universe last forever. Materialism derives from Latin materialis, that means substantial. It's also an ancient philosophical teaching about the objectiveness of the world and its independence from the will, governance, spirit and consciousness. In other words, everything is material. Materialism doesn't reject spiritual phenomena and values, but it considers them as features defined by matter on the highest levels of its development. The opposite teaching is idealism. The last modification of such materialism is Marxism. It's a pure materialistic point of view based upon the theory of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. What does it consist of? It's a system of philosophical, economic and socio-political views. It was formed in the middle of the 19th century. As I said in the introductory lecture, there was a demand for it, 
coming from the global mafia in order to solve their own issues, to preserve their governance of all the social processes on the planet. In particular, in order to restrain the process of people's consumption of material goods. What was the stated goal? Release their proletariat from capitalistic exploitation. In order to substantiate this goal, important components of matter and consciousness, along with the pattern of the historic process and so on, were analyzed. Marxism philosophy is regarded as scientific worldview. It denies the religious view of the world. In other words, it says that matter is primary. Consciousness is a consequence of a reflection of objective processes of the world. Matter changes qualitative state somehow itself. It happens on its own, without any governance. In other words, it somehow happened itself, and man came into existence. Why have I told you about these two powerful teachings? This is what we know and were taught. You can look it up in modern philosophical manuals and so on. Now I'm going to say what we were not told. There is such a book named The Primary School Reader, written by Vodovozov, published in St. Petersburg in 1878. It says that there existed a caste of Zhratsis for spiritual guidance and general ruling. They told the king, or pharaoh at that time, what to do. The major deity for Egyptians was Amun. It combines four deities. Goddess Nat is matter, constituting everything in the world. It's matter. God Nav is a spirit that animates matter, or power, making it combine, change, and act. In other words, it's a governance force, or in a contemporary way, it's information. It is also called energy. Goddess Pasht is infinite space, occupied by matter. God Sebag is infinite time, which we perceive through the permanent changing of matter. This Egyptian teaching says that everything comes from matter by means of invisible force, it occupies space and changes over time. It all mysteriously combines into a four hypostatical being named Amun. It is well known, you can look it up in this book named The Primary School Reader. Now, what was not known and what we were not told about is coming. There is a system called Sephirot. Here is a quote from a book called The Sacred Book of Thoth. Taro Arcana, written by an engineer of railways, Shmakov, and issued as a reprint edition in 1911. I will recite what Arkantan says. Wonderful and wise, Ia Ia Be Sabaoth, God of Israel, God alive and the eternal King, El Shaddai, merciful and forgiving, sublime and stained in eternity, holy is his name, inscribed in 32 characters and created his world, spurring it by three sephirims, beginnings, Sephar, Sipur, and Sefer. I recited Sefer Yitzira. It's the Hebrew name used in the Torah, meaning Book of Creation, Formation. The Book of Suzuri contains a note decoding the quotation. Sifar means numbers. Only numbers give us a possibility to determine essential purpose for each thing and being, and their relations to each other, to understand the goal which they were created for, all in all, measure of length, measure of capacity, measure of weight, motion and harmony. All these things are ruled by numbers. In other words, it is measure. Sipur expresses word and voice because it is God's word and the voice of God alive, who gave birth to creatures under their different forms, either external or internal. He should be measured in these words. And God said, let there be light and there was light. It is information. Sifar means the writing. The writing of God is the product of His creation. It is matter. And further on, God's words are His writing. God's thought is the word. Thus, thought, word and writing are the one in God, while in man they are three. That is to say, it is altogether in God, but man is arranged the way that he can perceive it, 
only by particularities. What did the ancient Egyptian dresses do? Look, anything that we know is material. There are five aggregate states of matter – solids, liquids, gases, plasma, and physical vacuum. There are also dynamic and static fields and different particles. It's just for erudition. At least, everyone knows that there are solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. Fire is also matter. Now, I have a question for those watching this video. Can you imagine abstract solid matter? You can only imagine it as a concrete thing, right? For instance, a piece of brick or iron. If you imagine water, it can be a river or water in a bottle. As we see, matter is unordered. Any matter has an image. There is no such thing as an imageless matter. In other words, anything has an image. This image and the unordered matter are information. We can get information on anything, as it, anything, contains all the information on itself. For instance, a piece of brick. It has weight, a color, a smell, an atomic structure, molecular structure, size, it has thickness, width and volume. All these features have one name – measure. Now, look at what we have. Anything is material, unordered, it has an image, and it contains all the information on itself. What did the ancient Egyptian dresses do? Having taken advantage of while in man there are three, they passed matter to science in order to keep scientists focused on particularities, but not the whole. Speaking of images, I shut my eyes, and I can imagine this camera. In my head there is no camera, but the image of this camera is shifted on the cells of my brain. We therefore say that there is no such thing as imageless matter. Images are shifted from one fragment of the universe onto another. Another question. Do I know everything about this camera? No, I don't. I know that somehow it happens with the help of this lens, then it goes somewhere and is somehow recorded. However, I don't know all the details. The camera contains all the information on itself. That's what does the trick. In other words, if you look at things this way, the universe is eternal and lasts forever. There are comets, planets, galaxy clusters, and so on. The universe contains the law of universal gravitation, the law of transmission of information, Ohm's law, and Kirchhoff's law. The question is, do we know all the laws? No, we don't. However, all the universe contains all the information on itself, but we cognate this entire measure by means of mastering particular measures. What did the ancient Egyptian dresses do? They passed matter to science, information or images of sacred spirit went to the church, and they concealed measure. Thanks to the concealment, they established the global principle of governance. What is primary, matter or consciousness? That's the trick. By the way, this question, what is primary, matter or consciousness, refers to a split mentality. The embodiment of this split mentality is our two-headed crest. There is no such bird. When a Tsar Emperor was inspecting one of the ships, he was asked to value the sailor's military and ideological indoctrinations. He went up to a sailor and asked him a question. What is our two-headed crest? The sailor sprouted up and said, It is a freak of nature, your majesty. There is no such bird. It is the embodiment of a split mentality. There is something else I'd like to say concerning images. Why did they give images to religions? When a person closes their eyes, they can operate them. This capability of operating images and analyzing by means of images allowed the ancient Egyptian dresses to fulfill this principle of governance. This is why church deals with spirituality, 
images and acquisition of the Holy Spirit. But science deals with matter, something that one can touch. One cannot touch images. However, you cannot separate one from the other. Now, let's illustrate what I have just said. Let's look into how man perceives the universe. Imagine that there is a person, the sun shining, and some clouds. He perceives all this. What happens? There is one fragment of the universe. There is another one, that's the person. All around is the environment. This fragment of the universe emits some oscillations. All these oscillations are perceived by another fragment of the universe. Under the action of these oscillations, something happens. Speaking of man, another fragment of the universe has some impact on him. Let's formalize this process. There is a transmitter and a receiver. There are also environment and frequency processes ongoing in the universe. Information comes from the outside world, but it can also come from the inner world. If you close your eyes, you dive into your inner world. So it's like waking yourself up by getting things out of your long-term memory, from your subconsciousness, and moving them onto the level of consciousness in order to process information. In other words, this information from the inside and outside worlds is perceived by senses, memorized by subconsciousness, and partly comes to consciousness. There is a very important thing. Man straight away perceives everything around him by means of his biofield, all at once. In other words, he perceives everything straight away through oscillating processes. However, not everything arrives at the level of consciousness, but he can get everything out of his subconsciousness. An example of getting things out of the subconsciousness is by having dreams. We will touch upon this in detail later. Now, I would like to say that if you ask a question, the universe, God, will immediately give you a reply. However, hardly anybody can move their reply onto the level of consciousness. As a rule, replies come in your dreams when man's brain, consciousness and subconsciousness, is waking up, but still asleep. You should linger this half-asleep state. How can you do that? You should stay in bed with your eyes closed in order to keep your brain asleep, so to say not to let it wake up. Images should come to you. What images usually come? It's simple. What language does God talk to you? The language you can understand. It means that the answer will come as imagery symbolizing your life. By the way, speaking of dream interpretation books, they were useful in the society when the information state of the society remained mostly unchanged throughout the time. For example, if you dreamt about a cucumber, that meant there would be some rain, and so on. You know, I dream about rockets, heating plants, and soldiers, so to say the things that I have had in my life all this time. For this reason, dream interpretation books are of no use. You should be able to find the appropriate reply to the information you get in your dreams, so to say, to decode it all. After that, you should correlate the problem you have with the image you get in your dream, and you will get the reply. I have a story about my friend. How did I meet him? He drove me in his car to Moscow and back my home to Krasnoznamensk. It took one hour and a half there and the same time back. I should say it's a whole lecture. Before that, he smoked and drank alcohol. Conversations about God were out of the question for him. I was reading these lectures to him. When it came to the topic about God and prayers, I told him that he had to try to ask God for a reply to the problem he had. I told him about dreams as well. I said that he had to try to correlate the images he would get with his problem. What was his prayer about? By the way, he wrote about this case in a newspaper. His prayer went like this. God, if you are really there, help me. They have fobbed me off with money. They fobbed a few ten thousand dollars of him. 
Before that, he had never had dreams. However, that morning he had a dream. Besides, it was a colorful dream, which is actually a rare thing. In his dream, he saw some papers. He also saw a shelf with these papers on it, and an office where that man worked, the man who had conned him for money. He woke up in a cold sweat. He forgot to take me with him, and he went to that office building by car right away. Later on, after he came to that office, by sheer coincidence, the office security let him in. By sheer coincidence, he went up to the right door, which he'd seen for the first time. In that office, there was a cleaner washing the floor, who also let him in. He entered there, opened a file cabinet and saw papers. In the papers, he found the man's name and discovered how that man had stolen the money. After that case, my friend quit smoking and drinking alcohol. In other words, God gives every person proof of his existence by means of the language of life circumstances. This is what I mean to say by this example. Now, let's look at this slide. Man's subconsciousness contains everything. However, he can bring only some parts up to the level of his consciousness. There is nothing tricky here. If desired, man can move everything onto the level of his consciousness. The easiest way is with dreams. It's an easy thing to do. For man's perception, not only for man's perception, there should be the following things. Speaking in terms of the radio technologies, the signal level should be higher than the threshold of sensitivity of the receiver. The receiver should be compatible with the transmitter of the environment on the interaction with each other parameter. In other words, there should be compatibility on the material carrier, on the coding system, on the frequency range, and so on. Compatibility on the coding system means, if someone speaks another language to you, you cannot understand that language, right? That's why God's language contains images. There should be fixation of information in the receiver. In other words, the information state should change. If your receiver has interference due to alcohol or drugs, you, putting it mildly, cannot function. You fail to perceive information. This is the process of how man perceives the universe. As we have already touched upon this aspect, I would like to tell you from the standpoint of Trinity what Russian saints did. The name of it is Acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Seraphim of Sarov restored the teaching on acquiring the Holy Spirit in the Russian Orthodox Church. He was therefore recognized as a saint and was canonized. Where did he acquire his Holy Spirit? In church? No, he didn't. I would like you to pay attention to the fact that those who acquired the Holy Spirit left for an abandoned place. In particular, Seraphim of Sarov acquired the Holy Spirit in a forest and prayed on a stone. Why? There are a lot of things in church that make you distracted. Icons, candles and other things keep you from being focused. Looking at all these things, a person cannot focus on God because all these things are distracting. What did Russian saints do? They went on a bread and water diet, so to say they fasted. They cleared up cells in their bodies with the help of pure water and ecologically pure food. Man consists of what he eats and drinks. In other words, speaking the language of radio technologies, they got rid of these distracting things by means of praying and solitude. This was how they adjusted their receivers. They got information not through dreams, but directly. To put it another way, they got that information as revelations. Nowadays, there are so-called clairvoyants. They say someone talks to them too. I'm going to omit this aspect now, but we will touch upon this topic in other videos. They should make sure whether they talk to God or something else. We will touch upon this topic when we discuss the sufficiently general theory of governance 
and the stability of processes. How can we describe the process of reflecting in creation? There is objective reality, so to say all creation, named matter. I think you should begin coming to understand that, in fact, God exists. It is the true God, and the creation he made, a variety of different things, is objective reality. This creation consists of visible matter. You know, they say there are visible matter and worlds of invisible matter, field structures. What is an invisible world? It is frequency processes, things we do not see. For example, gas, we do not see it. All matter is an odor. There is no such thing as imageless matter. Odor, image and spirit is something immaterial which in science has the name information. Everything has an image. There is no imageless matter. Let's look at the description of the processes of reflecting. What is information? Imagine a small house, sunshine, birds singing and so on. Imagine an artist painting a picture. You can see that the picture reflects the landscape of living nature. It is almost the same. Does the picture fully comply with the landscape? No, it doesn't. There is no dimension or movement in the picture. If we take a photo in the black and white photo, you can see the same landscape, but it is black and white. There are no colors. In the color photo, the landscape looks better. A videotape has movement. In other words, the surrounding world reflects on various material carriers – pictures, photos, videotapes and immense inner world. The image of the landscape is not changed on the various material carriers. However, this image differs. On one carrier it is black and white, on another carrier it can move, it can have dimension, smells and so on. In other words, the quality of this image reflecting differs. All we have been considering is marked by the Russian saying there is no imageless thing. Anything is material. It has an image, and this image is shifted onto different material carriers with a different quality. Objective material carriers as well as processes differ from each other, as you can get information concerning them. In this picture, you can see different wooden objects. What do we see here? We see a house made out of wood. Here you see a broad-leaf tree and a coniferous tree. In all the cases, it is wood matter. However, the images are different. We therefore distinguish wooden objects from each other by getting different information from them. This information contains a different measure. As you see, there are all possible states of matter in creation, the pan-universal measure, where there are Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, planets, comets and galaxies. This pan-universal measure contains everything. Do we know everything that the pan-universal measure contains? No, we don't. We get particularities, particular measures, as a drop, which we compare with another drop. Do you see what I mean? So to say, we get the criterion, distinction, between two measures of the pan-universal measure. What I mean to say? Anything is material. Anything is unordered and has an image. It contains the entirety of the data on itself. In other words, it is measured. In a more formal way, you can see that this pan-universal measure is an objective, full, multi-measured matrix of possible states in creation. We distinguish these particular measures by means of mastering particular measures, receiving particular information from all this objective entirety of creation. Next, what does the formalization of this process look like? There is one fragment of the universe and there is another one. 
every fragment of the universe, including man, emits oscillations. These oscillations are shifted from one fragment onto another one. What is past? The information and the image about this fragment of the universe are passed on, which somehow impacts another fragment of the universe. Here is a simple example – man and the sun. There are flares on the sun. As a result, man's cardiovascular system can constrict or dilate. What impacted man? Oscillations did. The so-called solar activity impacted him. What is a solar activity? It is an oscillation. It is light. Supposing you have been sunbathing on the beach too long. As a result, you have a sunstroke. You therefore feel dizzy. To put it another way, there is an impact on you. This fragment of the universe has different qualities of information reflection. Threshold of sensitivity, coding system, frequency range, polarization, and so on. Let's look at Linnitz's definition of matter. Why? Because all our textbooks and science contain Linnitz's definition of matter. Matter is a philosophical category denoting the objective reality which is given to man by his sensations and which is copied, photographed and reflected by his sensations, while existing independently from them. Let's look at this definition from the previous standpoint when we were talking about fragments of the universe. Matter is a philosophical category denoting the objective reality. What is it? It is the objective reality, creation itself, or you can say the universe. The next one is, which is given to man by his sensations and which is copied, photographed and reflected. What is it? It's a tautology. We can reduce it to one word – reflection. Reflection is a feature of the whole universe reflecting on material carriers. Further, what Vladimir Ilyich Lenin said is pure Satanism. It sounds like a way to perdition as man falls out of harmony. To put it another way, fragments can reflect, but we cannot. But this is not possible. The universe exists as a continuous process of reflection. That phrase is pure Satanism, which means that man falls out of creation. Can you imagine what kind of worldview it all creates in people's minds? What Lenin said sounds like everything in the universe is interdependent and interconditioned, except man. But it is a mistake. On one hand, it looks like nothing, but on the other hand, as Kazma Prutkov said, from small causes there are very important consequences, which, in particular, influence the destiny of our country. Therefore, matter, information and measure is a process of trinity. Matter and information exist as predetermined processes. Matter changes the information content within the boundaries of measure in a predetermined way. Now let's define matter. Matter is a thing that changes its information content and shifts from one state to another. It contains the other which changes during the process when some material objects, processes, impact others. In precise terms, matter is a substance in solid, liquid and gas states. Plasma is a highly ionized gas in which molecules of chemical compounds lose the stability and break down, but atoms of chemical elements lose electrons. Matter is also elementary particles, quantums, static and dynamic fields, and physical vacuum. What is energy? Energy is transitional existence of matter. What is plasma? It is when solids turn to gases and emit energy. This is how energy shows up, or vice versa, when the cooling process takes place. To put it another way, they are transitional forms of matter existence. Images, information and other are immaterial, but none can exist without a material carrier. You cannot imagine an image if there is no material carrier. 
I'm looking at all these things around me here, in this room. I can shut my eyes and imagine all these things. I can imagine that picture and that camera. Where is the image shifted? The image of the camera is shifted onto the cells of my brain. In other words, information cannot exist independently without a material carrier. What is a book? Which type of carrier contains this information? A paper carrier does. The letters are measure. Every letter or word is a code. It is measure. Therefore, measure is a particularity with the help of which we designate a quantum of information or something else. And it has to be on a material carrier. Multi-measure. I drew such a picture. We say that it is a multi-measured probabilistic matrix of possible states. Let's look at what multi-measure is. But first, let's look at two-measure or two-dimensionality. We all studied it at school. It is the axis of abscissi and the axis of ordinates. It is two-dimensional, two-measured. In this example, we can show a person's weight. For instance, a baby is born. Here you see the time and his weight. He was growing up and putting on weight. His weight varied over time. At school, we also dealt with three measure or three dimensionality. Three measured space is volumetric. There are three axes, including axis Z. With these three axes, you can describe any process using any three factors. Here you can describe the same process using height, weight and time. How can we show a four-measured process? Graphically, we cannot show it. Speaking of multi-measure, we also contain measure. Where can we see multi-measure in man? Let's look at the following parameters. Weight, height, quantity of hair on the head. As man gets older, he can lose hair. Throughout life, man can have blood pressure drops, different diseases and knowledge. The process of understanding is a processing algorithm of incoming information. Man's most important particular measure is the capability of processing incoming information that he receives. How can man consider information? How can he will the criterion, distinction, in order to understand processes? Getting back to the Jewish tradition of circumcision that we have been talking about, the circumcision disorders one of the measures. It is the most important thing, because it disorders processing algorithmics of incoming information. It is an example of multi-measure. In movies and books, we often hear such terms as third dimension or fifth dimension. However, we should understand that God is the only one who can know the whole multi-measured matrix of possible states. We therefore say that the matrix is multi-measured. We don't know yet to what degree. We don't know yet, but maybe one day we will. What did the ancient Egyptian races do by hiding measure? It is simple to understand. Let's look at the picture where we see man. He has to make his choice. There are two options. There is a lie and the truth. Man has to understand where the truth is. Soon or later, man will understand where the truth is. He's not that stupid. He will make mistakes and make a mess, but he will understand what true means. What did the ancient Egyptian races do in order to prevent man from never understanding what true is? They hid the truth, the correct vision of the world. They gave a false vision of the world. How did they do it? They split the lie into two parts, lie one and lie two. Man is put in a situation where he has to make a choice between two lies. Hence the following questions. What comes first, matter or consciousness? This question does not contain the truth. Another question. They say, who is right, science or religion? The question itself is nonsense. 
the world is one and holistic. I'd like to say that including the philosophical category of measure enables science and religion to join. So to say, it helps resolve the contradiction called to divide and conquer. They say, what is better, capitalism or socialism? Protesting with the red banners in their hands, they just kill each other. But in fact, it is just the global slave civilization. Under capitalism, it is open. But in the USSR, it was a hidden crowd elite pyramid. First, they pretended that everything was good in their place, but then it got revealed. Nothing more. Another question is, which economy is more effective, planned economy or market economy? In the introductory lecture, I said that a plan is a goal that you have to reach, but the market is a way of reaching the goal. The juxtaposition of plan to market is schizophrenia. All science suffers from this schizophrenia. It's false science, therefore the whole matrix needs changing. The reason why we study this conversation lies in a worldview. It is the fundamental thing. If you move in the right direction, everything will become clear for you. If you move in the wrong direction, you will make mistakes. Sooner or later, these mistakes will come up to the surface. Now, let's look into this four hypostatical moon. What is it? Goddess Net is matter. God Nef is energy. Goddess Pasht is space. God Sebek is time. Which philosophical categories of this Amun are true? Only one, it is matter. Energy Nef is a transitional form of material existence. Space and time are particular measures of the pan-universal measure. They are subjective measures, they are not objective ones. In other words, how does man take measure of space? The measurement unit can be the meter. But first, people measured short distances based on the length of the forearm, from elbow to fingertip. What is time? In the universe, objectively, there is no time. Time is a subjective characteristic introduced by man in order to measure frequency processes. Everything in the universe is oscillatory. Man began to use different measurements. All oscillations have frequencies of oscillations. How does man measure day and night? By means of hours. The Earth spins around the Sun, it is one year. To measure other processes, we have hertz, kilohertz, and so on. They are all subjective measurements. Now imagine, man is gone. What about time? Is it gone too? It is a subjective characteristic introduced by man, which enables us to measure various frequency processes in creation via our intentionally chosen particular measure. We can get to know pan-universal time only if we get beyond the boundaries of the universe. We cannot do it yet. We don't know how we can get beyond the universe as it is eternal and lasts forever. All science is based on this ancient Egyptian lie – matter, space, energy and time. In the introductory lecture, we talked about Ronald Harbert's Dianetics, which is based on the system MEST – matter, energy, space and time. In other words, it is based on Amun. Here lies the mistake. In fact, all the processes are interdependent. By reading books for initiates, which hardly anybody can read, you can come across this information in the footnotes of the book Suzuri. Now let's talk about the magic of the word. Let's look at how wizards, warlocks, magicians and others of this kind work. This standpoint makes it clear for your understanding how it all works. Look what they all do. All man's diseases get caused by nerves. In fact, all diseases are of information nature. Even traumas are of information nature. Let's not make it more complicated. I just want to give you such an example. They say that wolves could balance man's will. 
Вол – воля, means will. And хв – хавать, means to hide. The thing is, if man makes peace with nature, he emits and receives oscillations. Everything is fine if these oscillations coincide with the harmony of nature. It is like man does not cross the line, as he also lives in harmony with nature. If man falls out of harmony, or does not get on with God, goes against the law of nature, he crosses this line. His will becomes unbalanced. As a result, he falls ill. What did wolves do? They balanced the will so that man could live in harmony with nature. How did they do it? Now we know that man is triunited. Matter is what man consists of, what he drinks, eats, and so on. Informationally, he is the same. I mean, we all have one head, two arms, and so on. We all look alike. What makes us different? We have a different measure of understanding. The highest measure of understanding is an algorithm of information processing. To put it another way, if we follow the standards that correspond to the standards of creation, we do not fall out of harmony. But if we don't, then we fall out of harmony. When man's measure of his biofield is unbalanced, he falls out of harmony. As a result, he falls ill, because more powerful forces impact him. Therefore, his measure of biofields should be balanced. What did a wolf do? Nowadays we call them psychics. Supposing that person was suffering from some kind of ulcer because of anger that he had. A wolf said something, some kind of spell or a prayer. The thing is, any prayer or mantra is an oscillatory process, so to say, it is an information impact. That oscillatory process impacted that person. Under the impact of the oscillations, the patient's measure of biofields was changed one way or the other. His biofield became anodered. His anodered biofield changed its informational state. As a result, his ulcer disappeared. By the way, I met some psychics. As a rule, they are women in our country. One of them was Nina Nikolaevna. She lived in Kronstadt. I talked to her about what exactly she did, but she answered me that she didn't know anything. She said that her grandmother gave her some advice. For instance, if that person's cornea were of some color and if he had some symptoms, she said a prayer of a certain kind. If that person had some other symptoms, she said a prayer of another kind and gave him some kind of herbs. The point is, she didn't even understand what she was doing. With the help of the Trinity, you can realize how it all works. I don't know all the details of what she did, but I know how it all works. Speaking of sounds, I should say that some rhythms are really harmful and zombifying. Therefore, traditional Russian songs are melodic due to long notes. How does it all work? Every organ in our body has its own resonant frequency. I mean, the heart has its own resonant frequency, the lungs have their own resonant frequency, and so on. When people sing mantras, these sound oscillations massage the organs. You know, for instance, if your muscle is numb, you should massage it. It works the same way here. Singing traditional Russian songs, we did it in a natural way. We didn't need any mantra, we sang in chorus. Singing in chorus balanced Russian people's measures of biofields. You know, these fractured rhythms of modern songs help to zombify man's psyche. A traditional Russian song contains some kind of entirety, but these fractured rhythms contain some kind of particularities. Man, therefore, becomes psychologically constrained in a way. Speaking of drum rhythms, they are to the beat of sexual oscillations. Guitarists on stage, therefore, show body movements similar to the movements of a sexual act. It all leads to an animal psychotype. So the thing that you have to understand is, 
any process of information transmission from one fragment of the universe to another one is a governing process. By the way, one of the fragments of the universe is man. Whether you want it or not, when you pass information to someone, you actually govern, rule. It is another question what kind of impact that information will have on that person you passed it to. Here we also have to talk about journalists, mass media and things like that. What is the word? Fyodor Ivanovich Tuchev has such a passage in one of his poems. God did not let us second guess how our word would come back slanted, yet empathy to us is granted, the same way with his grace we are blessed. Tuchev could say so because he lived in that information state. At that time you said something, but the consequences of your spoken words could show up only decades later. By that time you were just gone. Nowadays updating information goes fast due to the law of time. Therefore it is not permissible to talk about things you have no idea about, such as global politics and the other things set out in the conception of social safety, because in this case you are a toolkit of destruction. Matter. In life people come across some phenomena such as strikes, non-pavements, floods and so on. Information is images of this phenomena. Measure is word. In other words, we give an appropriate word to every phenomenon that we have in life. A camera, a person, a strike, a flood are words, but by these words every person understands his own image. Pay attention to this ring enclosure. There is a phenomenon which has an image, and this image is vested with a word. People pronounce words which cause images in other people's minds. According to these images, people understand or do not understand the phenomena. If words correctly describe images without distortion, the process goes properly because the words correctly vest these phenomena with appropriate meanings. Now imagine that the word is distorted. So to say, the image is vested with the wrong word because of ignorance or by design. Do you remember, in the introductory lecture I said a couple of examples. The USSR came down, butter became more expensive. Whether I understand it or not, I distorted the image. In fact, the USSR was purposely brought down. Another example. Here the meaning is distorted, but not the word itself. It is the black square by Malevich. It is merely sick imagination. Abstractionists paint what actually does not exist in life. These images are distorted and vested with distorted words. Distorted words form distorted images, which, in turn, form distorted phenomena. Distorted phenomena constantly produce distorted images in the consciousness of millions of people, which results in forming distorted concepts and understandings. If these concepts and understandings are vested with misconceptions, then it can sound like the conception of national safety. Then a question arises. Which nationality do you mean? There are a lot of nationalities. If the answer is like, this name was approved, then the question should be, approved by whom? What I mean to say is, a word is a code. You cannot neglect it. Taking this into consideration, let's look at what happened to Vladislav Listiev, a Russian journalist and head of Channel One, assassinated in 1995. He actually killed himself. Why? What did he tell people on TV? What was his program about? It was about killers. He told people about killers and vested this phenomenon with their own measure. He made it look like heroism. You know, there are a lot of movies where bad guys look like heroes. Watching these movies, a young generation absorbs it. It becomes acceptable. It all causes youth violence. I have another example. Between 1995-1997, and 
I often visited Sevastopol. There I was told one story, which took place in a kindergarten. In that kindergarten there had been a sharp rise in traumatism. Later it turned out that the cause of traumatism was Western films. At that time Western films were beginning to pop up on every corner. People were buying video recorders to watch these films at home. The plot of most of them is about killing, shooting, fighting and so on. The thing is, a kid regards it all as a normal and acceptable thing. Then this kid goes to kindergarten and begins copying the behavior of one of the film characters by breaking a chair against another kid's head. This is what happened in that kindergarten. It is a consequence of that culture cultivation, which leads to misunderstanding at a very early age. This is a simple example. There are so many misconceptions, not only on the so-called physical level, but also on the level of more delicate concepts and understandings, where false ideals are imposed on us. By means of what? By means of words. Now, you see the role of journalists on TV, who do not realize what they do, as they don't vest it with the precise measure of understanding because they do not understand the cause-effect relationships. Thus, we become more stuck in this inferno. From the standpoint of conducting a cold war, taking into consideration what we have already discussed, let's look at the following things. Do they always tell us lies on TV? No, they don't. We are told, there has been an explosion, or there has been a murder, Russian people look at it and think, Russia is gone, you cannot save it. As a result, such people grab a glass of vodka and you know. Who does it? Do you think someone summoned up all the journalists and said, here is your money, go and destroy your country? Of course not. They do it because of their own stupidity. Unlike Fyodor Ivanovich Tuchev, their words boomerang back on every one of them, like our journalist Vladislav Listiev. Why? Because this is a law of time. All things happen quickly. You say a word and it will quickly come back to you. This is what measure is from the standpoint of the Trinity. Here is another example. This picture shows the planet with civilizations on it. Russia is imposed by the Western model or the Eastern one. You know, we are imposed by Western values and so on. However, Russia does not go either way. Why? Because from the standpoint of matter, information and measure, human civilization is under continued hierarchical governance, whether we like it or not. The Western civilization consists of a lot of countries, what values do they have? They represent the materialistic civilization, which is based on the improvement of constantly growing material needs. The Eastern civilization is a civilization of spirit. Withdrawal and self-improvement are cultivated in India, Japan and other countries. However, Russia does not go either way. Therefore, they are trying to impose Western values on us such as the Western economic model, among other things. Or they try to impose on us the Eastern ones. Speaking of martial arts, in the East they have the Shaolin temple. However, hardly anybody knows that Russian Vitezis under Svetoslav got naked, entered a trans state, and on horseback they engaged in a battle and successfully battled with Khazar Kaganate. They could also establish a coherence with each other. However, they keep imposing on us with the Western and Eastern values. But Russia resists. Why? Neither the Western model nor the Eastern model is acceptable for us. Why? Because Russia itself is a civilization. Russia is the civilization of measure. Speaking of this, we are ahead of the Western and the Eastern civilizations. What I mean to say is, the Western civilization, consisting of many states, has just come to the establishment of the common currency 
and the demolition of the boundaries. The European Parliament came into existence a short time ago. Rats in one state combined the interests of Nanayans, Tatars, Yakuts, Chuvash people, and so on. In other words, we are a civilization which is different from those other two. How do we differ from them? We have already been through it. I mean, we had a common currency and we didn't have boundaries. What's more, we had the united culture of the multinational Russia. I can actually tell young generations that I can still remember friendship between nations being cultivated under Stalin. There was the friendship of nations founding in Vadenha. We also had days of literature. We were brought up in that way. I know it sounds unusual for you, but we really had it all. What's more, we held concerts of Georgian dances. Furthermore, not a single culture and not a single nation, people, were destroyed in Russia. We also had mistakes, but you know, the one who doesn't do anything never makes mistakes. There were mistakes after Stalin. The USA, however, annihilated the multinational civilization of Native Americans. They were just slaughtered. As for us, we still have the multinational population. What policy does the West pursue towards us? They try to break us apart, making borders between us, but they will fail. History is irreversible. Look, according to the Trinity, the Western civilization is a civilization of matter, and the Eastern civilization is a civilization of spirit, but Russia is the civilization of measure. Russia is one of the compartments. Japan is a compartment, France is a compartment, and so on. A question arises, which rules will we live by? By the rules of the West? Then we will just kill each other. The compartments will collide with each other. The submarine will sink. So we have to establish a new world order. What kind of order? How will we live with each other? We think that there should be one global civilization, and if one wants to, a one world government. However, the question is, which rules will that government govern by? By these rules, I'm good, but you're all idiots. Or by other rules, we are all people and every person is an individual. Every country and every nation have the right to live. It shouldn't be the way it is now, where some reign over others. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. This is how this process is perceived from the standpoint of the Trinity, matter, information and measure. Here you can see a universe. There are galaxies and comets. This is the Earth, with man living on it. All processes in the universe are oscillatory. Every element in the universe passes information onto another fragment of the universe. Everything is interdependent and interconditioned. All the processes are oscillatory. Man does not fall out of the reflection process, as Lenin stated. Which means, man is not out of the world. It is not possible. Man should live in harmony with the universe. Matter and information, therefore, change according to the measure of development of the entire universe, which, in turn, has an intellect. But we will get into that later. What parameters can we use to describe the universe? The universe is eternal and expands forever. It works in a mode of an everlasting engine. It has inanimate matter, which has an internal code, and animate matter, which can appear and disappear. All matter in the universe is unordered. All the processes in the universe are oscillatory. Time is a subjective category introduced by man. By the way, there are different types of time. For example, computers have a so-called time machine. So the processes occurring in our world can be compressed by means of computing devices. What in reality takes hundreds of years, there it takes a few seconds. 
there is also biological time. If we speak of invisible worlds, it is just about the oscillation frequency. If we are in a certain range of frequencies with a certain time of comparison, but they, invisible worlds, are in a high frequency range, then their information capacity is far bigger than ours. Therefore, we do not perceive them. The polarization is also important in this case. I try to graphically depict it. Imagine, we oscillate like this, but they oscillate like that. We therefore do not see their oscillations. It is a direct line for us. In order to see invisible worlds, we need to expand our information state. Speaking of the spiral of evolution, when I was in the military academy, Colonel Shadrin, who taught me, drew a spiral of evolution which had no beginning and no end. The conception of social safety has a more distinct vortex with stepped edges, inside of which there is a rope, and every circle is the ground for the next circle. If there is no previous circle, there will be a collapse. I just gave you such an image. In fact, the spiral unwinds according to the multi-measured probabilistic matrix of possible states of matter. Entrance to a new step is possible according to the saturation of information capacity. It is possible and irreversible only after information saturation occurs in previous stages. I have already told you about General Rocklin before. He tried to overtake the measure of development. If we want to get out of the situation in Russia and in the world, our society needs to be saturated with it. Otherwise, if you talk to people, they will not understand and they will not accept it. This thing seems to be obvious. By the way, it is one of the basic points of our political party. But you can understand it only after what I have told you. Those who do not understand it always intend to do it quickly. They don't understand that they can perish as they need it now. They will definitely fail, because you cannot overtake the measure of development. I also want to say that nothing happens accidentally. Any coincidence is statistical predetermination. Now, let's look at what the mutual hierarchy of processes looks like. Here is the universe. It develops under God's governance, according to the pan-universal matrix. Here you can see the vortex of this matrix. This vortex is inscribed with other vortexes, in particular the Earth. The biosphere of the planet Earth develops according to its own matrix. In this matrix of Earth's biosphere, there is the human race as a super system, which consists of every single man. In other words, every fragment of the universe develops according to its own matrix. You should also know, if some fragment of the universe neglects the impact of more powerful factors, it will fail anyway. Let's look at the things from the standpoint of the theory of governance. The universe is a driver, and the Earth is a car. The universe steers the car, the Earth. There is feedback coming from the Earth, so to say, there is indication of pressure, petrol sensors, and so on. It is suicidal to neglect the governing impacts from the side of these processes, rhythms and oscillatory processes of the cosmos, ongoing in the biosphere of the planet Earth. One needs to take these impacts into consideration when making decisions on life arrangements. This methodology we began with is the basis for a world perception. If man perceives the world right, he will act right. Summarizing this lecture on the Trinity, matter, information and measure, I would like to say something else. The human race has reached a dead end, so to say a global system crisis. In order to get out of this global system crisis, we all need to work out the right point of view, to understand the surrounding world right. The false worldview was imposed on us. For many years it was the dominant one, and the principle of it is divide and conquer. Their formulation of the basic question, 
What is primary matter of consciousness? Is a false formulation of the question. In fact, all processes in the universe are interdependent and interconditioned. All processes are oscillatory and represent the process of the Trinity. Matter changes the information content according to the measure of development. Having hidden this Trinity, the globalists, the global mafia, fulfill their principle of governance, divide and conquer. If man introduces the understanding of measure into his worldview, it will enable him to work out the correct worldview, in order to understand the surrounding world correctly and take the right decisions to consciously act in this difficult situation. Our lecture has come to an end. Further, we will look into the global historical process.